Good morning. Welcome to the worship service of the Graver Road Church of Christ. I know that two weeks ago, we would have had a very difficult time envisioning this type of worship, but because of the circumstances that are going on in our world right now with the coronavirus, we feel like it's necessary for us to maintain the social distancing that our government and other experts have advised us to do. So I hope that you will follow along this morning as we attempt to worship our God together virtually. I'd like to read a scripture as we begin, and the scripture is found in Isaiah chapter 41, beginning at verse 10. It says there, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Words that we need to hear at this time of difficulty and uncertainty, and the elders and the preachers here at Graber Road are striving to maintain some semblance of normal worship so that we can still be joined together as a congregation and to worship God together in spirit and in truth. Let's have a brief word of prayer together as we begin our worship service. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can be here today. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship together. Father, we know that this is a very different time uh, that we're uh, not used to. We pray that you be with each member of the Graber Road family. Help them to know that this is only for a short time until we can be together again physically. Help us to remember the teachings that you've, ta- that you've given to us in Hebrews chapter 10, that we are to gather together and to worship you and to assemble as the household of faith. Bless us this morning as we worship together. Bless our worship and help us to engage ourselves in the songs and the, and the prayers and the thoughts that are offered and to do our very best to push the cares and the anxieties of this world out of our minds. Father, we're thankful for Jesus and for all of the blessings that we have in him, for the salvation that we hold that we know can't be taken away by anything. Father, forgive us of the things that we do that are wrong and bless us as we worship today. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. To God be the glory. Would you pray with me, please? Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this first day of the week when we can come together and worship you. Pray that we do that in a way that is acceptable to you. We thank you for the plan that you have given us for our lives and the blessings that you show to us each and every day. We thank you for your word, 
which you give us in your Bible. We thank, we're thankful, Lord, for the instructions that it gives us on how that you would want us to live to be obedient to you. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for your son and what he means to us and the love that you showed to us in sending him to live and to die on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. Dear Lord, we know that we fail you and we just ask for forgiveness. Help us to do better. Help us to always remember what you have taught us. Help us to remember to be the examples that you want us to be. Dear Lord, as we look at the troublesome times that are in our community, in our country, and in our world, and we realize that you have control over all, and the fact that you love us is a true blessing and a comfort. We pray that you would be with our congregation here at Graber Road and brothers and sisters all over the world and help us to realize that you love us and that you want the best for us. Please give us comfort and peace as we go through these times. Help us, Lord, to, to realize that our goal should be to do the things that you have told us to do, to be obedient to your word, so that we could have a home with you in eternity. Help us to live the lives that will help us to accomplish that. We know, Lord, that everything that we have and everything that comes to us comes through you. And dear Lord, we're just thankful for the fact that you love us and for the privilege of being your children. We just ask humbly that you watch over us, watch over our congregation, watch over the situations that are occurring in this world. Give us safety. Dear Lord, strengthen us to where we can strengthen each other and build each other up so that we can get through these times. But more than anything else, thank you for the privilege of being your children. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Christ, we do all adore Thee, and we do praise Thee forever. Christ, we do all adore Thee, and we do praise Thee forever. For on the holy cross I Family, we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper. Just going through the mechanistic or the mechanism of it, if you don't mind briefly, we, on our cups we have both the bread as well as the fruit of the vine. If you open up the small cellophane portion of it, it'll expose the bread. Then, following that, you can lift up the dark purple portion, and that exposes the uh, the grape juice. Now, let us turn our minds back. 
to the sacrifice that Christ made in our stead. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. And when the hour had come, he sat down in the twelve apostles with him, and he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Our gracious Father, we are indeed thankful this morning to be able to assemble as your family on the first day of the week and remember the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for each and every one of us. Father, as we take this bread this morning, may we remember the body that Jesus gave up on the cross of Calvary, how it was broken and tortured for each one of us. Without that sacrifice, Father, we would be lost even today. Bless us, each and every one, and our family members as we partake together. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Let us bow. Father, again, we continue our prayer unto you being thankful, Father, for the saving blood of Jesus Christ. We recognize, Father, that without coming into contact with that blood, we do not have salvation. We recognize, Father, through the plan of salvation that you've given us through baptism, that we do come into contact with that blood. Father, as followers of yours and brothers of Christ, we realize, Father, we have been instructed to partake of this Lord's Supper this morning. We're thankful for the symbol of the fruit of the vine, Father, because Christ told us that it is as his blood, Father. We realize, Father, that this symbol is something that we partake each Lord's Day in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. Thank you for that sacrifice, Father, and may we partake worthily in your Son's name. Amen. Father, we also give you the opportunity, we take this opportunity now to give back to the work of the church. How that, Father, on the first of the week you have commanded that we lay by in store with purpose to give back to you for the support of the kingdom. Help us, Father, as we give this morning, help us to give liberally and help us to give faithfully. May this be used for the upbuilding of your church all over. We thank you for our family here at Graber Road. Continue to be with us today as we give. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. wow. 
Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Bible says that the disciples, the women that followed Jesus on the very first day of the week, while it was early in the morning, came and ran to the tomb because they had prepared spices. I'm sitting here this morning in this worship service and the clock on the wall says it's five till seven and we're trying our best so that the rest of us can get to to worship by 10 to get this done this morning, but we're thankful that you're joining us. And I also recognize what a difficult and what a seemingly cruel thing it is and the fact that we're able to come here this morning to the place where we would normally come, as Steve mentioned just a little while ago, and yet at the same time, we're also recognizing that we're here while a whole lot of you wish to be here this morning. And what can we say? It's a rotten circumstance. It just is. But at the same time, it makes us to long for the time when we can all be together again and realize that we can do things the way that the Lord absolutely wants them to be done and the way that we want them to be done. And so as we think about the, our lesson this morning, as we think about uh, not being together this morning, I hope it is that you and your family have purposed this time to worship together as is our normal, uh, a normal assembling as much as possible. And I hope this encouragement and this uh, worship service has been helpful to you and encouraging to you, as I know it already has been to me, even though it's uh, terribly early in the morning. It was a very busy time for Jesus. It was a very busy time as his disciples followed him around, and as they moved from seemingly one event to the very next, and they continued to follow this, uh, this man, this, this, this teacher, this rabbi around, they followed him and, well, they, they got lost in the busyness. And as Jesus would explain things to them, and then they'd go on and do some more teaching, and he would do some more teaching, and uh, he would heal people, and he would take care of them, and then they would go and they would follow him to some other place, it seemed like to me that they weren't expecting, this was the last thing in their mind, to have an occasion where everything came to a screeching halt because they feared for their very lives. And I think about our lives today and what it is as, as our world um, has this problem. And you know what? I'm sick of hearing about coronavirus, honestly. I'm, I'm, I want to throw up whenever I hear that anymore. Uh, or COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to mention that this morning. I'm not going to mention anything about social distancing other than this mention of mentioning social distancing and COVID-19. And, and I want you to understand that it's not about that. What we're going to call this this morning is, uh, just as a euphemism, is just present distress, because that's what Paul called whatever it was that the Corinthians were going through uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that this present distress, that's simply what it is. But I think about our busyness and how it is that just as the church and just as our calendar has suddenly cleared out based upon what, what it is that we're going through today and people that are fearing for their very lives... Two weeks ago, this is probably the last thing that was on any of our minds. And yet, what the disciples learned here on this occasion in Mark chapter 4 is very relevant today for us in our present distress. And realizing that Jesus is still master over the tempest. And there's coming a time when that storm is going to pass over just like we just finished singing. And there's coming a time when it is that we're not going to hear anymore about what it is that's causing this present distress. 
But what I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, this morning and friends, is that Jesus cares for us, even whenever it is that we feel like we're on our own. I invite you, if you haven't already, to open up your Bible to Mark chapter 4. That's the passage we're going to be uh, reading out of and working out of this morning. You'll find the same uh, same, uh, uh, account occurring again and again, uh, occurring two other gospel accounts, that is Luke chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 8. But the point that I want you to get from this is it doesn't matter the size of the storm. It remains that we still have a God and a Savior who is greater than anything. I want you to understand this this morning as we talk about Jesus being master over the tempest. And that is, number one, Jesus cares for us when we are in great danger. Jesus cares for me when there is great danger. Look at your Bible, please, and uh, and as you look at uh, at this this storm that occurs. In Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 8 and verse 24, the Bible says that it comes upon them suddenly. There is a suddenness to the storm that these disciples obviously weren't prepared for. We mentioned a couple weeks ago, I guess, on Sunday evening, talking about the geography of Palestine. But if you've got maybe those maps in the back of your Bible, you open up to them and you look and you see that the Sea of Galilee is far to the north. And then there's a long, uh, long, long blue string that's the River Jordan all the way down to the Dead Sea. If you go north of the Sea of Galilee, what you're going to come across is Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon, I believe, is over 10,000 feet high. But what happens is, is that these storm systems swoop over the top of Mount Hermon and come down into this bowl-shaped valley of where the Sea of Galilee is. And so that storm is able to come upon them suddenly, and it's able to whip up that water really, really quickly. You know, the Sea of Galilee, as I understand it, is only about uh, uh, a couple miles wide, but it's only about 200 feet deep. And as you look at this location, which is 680 feet above sea level, and it's still in this bowl-shaped valley. I lived in the Austin area several years, and one of the things they said is that what, uh, what made allergy season so miserable over in the Austin area is because it's a giant bowl-shaped area, and so all of the cedar pollen gets blown around, and it just keeps circulating and circulating. Oh, it's miserable. But can you imagine these disciples as they have this storm come upon them and it's whipping up these seas underneath them and now it is that they're having to deal with this sudden storm where it it might have been that just previously they had clear skies. But notice also that the Bible talks about the severity of the storm. The Bible calls this storm a windstorm. It calls it a squall. It calls it a whirlwind. But then it adds the, uh, the adjective mega. This is a huge storm. This is a huge squall. This is a huge windstorm. And Mark says that the waves were beating into the boat so that it was already filling. Luke says that they were in jeopardy. And Matthew says the boat was being overtaken or eclipsed by the waves. There were moments where you couldn't see part of the ship because of the way that it was that the, uh, that the waves were hitting it. Without warning, this boat was in great danger. But then I've got to think about the source of this storm. The source of the storm. Where did it come from? We might talk about it in terms of natural occurring weather patterns. You know, God made the world and he made it as a world of order and we know that there's jet streams and there's all kinds of things that can influence the weather. It could have just been a natural occurrence. At the same time, I think about the, the book of Job and Job chapter 1 and how it was that Satan used the storm in order to try and uh, throw Job off course. Can you imagine Satan knowing that the Son of God is here on this earth and knowing that these 12 that were following him were preachers of his word and preachers of his way and followers of his way? Well, that's quite the opportunity if it is that Satan was allowed to use that. Uh, So it was that he might try and sink the the boat where the Son of Man lied and uh, was and where it was that his disciples were following. Maybe it was that this storm, again, I would be hard-pressed to argue that The Lord allowed these disciples to go through this storm. The Lord might have been the source of the storm so that their faith could increase. But as I think about this in terms of us, I think about how it is that problems can arise in our lives all of a sudden. About how it is that we have a present distress, a difficulty that we're facing now that 
who would have ever thought this would have come upon us? Who would have ever thought in our lifetime, today in America 2020, where we control everything, where we've got everything down to a science of, of following the weather patterns and following all these things, and then realizing that our lives are brought to a screeching halt by something I can't even see. It occurs to me that just like the depth of the Sea of Galilee, how great these storms shake us in our lives has a direct relationship to the depth of our faith. If I take just a little bowl full of water and I just put a little bit of water down in the middle of a bowl and I blow, uh, uh, blow across it very simply, that water is going to be swirling and twirling all the way around. However, if I take that same size container, but I make it super deep, I can be blowing and the top of that water is whipping up. But you know what's happening down underneath? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. If I've got a depth to my faith, it is that these things that come upon us, the depth of our spiritual lives is going to determine the force with which things like this shake us. That's why James, I believe, wrote in James chapter 1, verses 3 and following, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have her perfect work so that you may be complete, lacking in nothing. And he goes on to talk about that person who's, uh, who asks in doubting, and he says he's like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the winds. He said, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man. That is, he's living too much in this world and trying to live too much with Jesus in the boat. The thing I've got to realize is Jesus cares about me when I'm in the midst of this storm and when there's great danger about me. Number two, Jesus cares when it is that I have great doubts. Jesus cares when I have great doubts. The disciples on this occasion ask a relevant question. Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? Note what they're doubting. They're doubting his concern for them. We just uh, talked about the fact that Jesus has come off a very, very busy day. He's had a very, very busy ministry up until this point. And Jesus is the one who's now sleeping in the stern of the boat. He's tired. He's, uh, he's spent, as it were. And after preaching this, this lesson at the very beginning of Mark chapter 4, on the same day they get in the boat to cross over the other side, and these men are now fighting for their very lives, and they, they wake him up, Master, Lord, Teacher. Luke repeats the term twice, Master, Master. And it's not Master, Master. They're trying to shake this man awake. And Matthew adds, do you not care? Luke says, save us. They had already seen Jesus cast out demons. They had already seen him restore a man's hand just in the book of Mark. They had already seen him heal a paralytic. They had already seen him care, uh, take care of countless others. He obviously cared for these. Lord, don't you care for us? Don't you care for us when we go through these difficulties? They doubted his concern, but they also doubted his commitment to them. Master, we are perishing. It's easy to imagine these men paddling, rowing, fighting for their very lives, straining. And folks, please don't misunderstand. These men are experienced fishermen. These men are experienced fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, the one that they're, tra they're traveling on right now. They were experienced fishermen by trade, and they knew these waters that they'd sailed. But we don't know the length of time that they had been fighting against the storm and they had been straining, thinking about we've got this. We can take care of this. We've been through storms before. It's going to be okay. But it comes to a point where they know that they're in distress. They know that they're in dire circumstances. And I think about myself that sometimes it's only whenever it is that we're so busily paddling to stay afloat that we forget who's in the boat with us. We wait till we're in distress to call upon the Lord like the disciples do in Mark 4 verse 38. The truth is, is that we all have a blind spot called pride. We all have a blind spot called pride and remembering who's with us. That is the Lord of all is with us. Why should we be afraid? He's the one that made the storm. He's the one that can make the calm. And when storms still happen to today, like this present distress, I've got to ask the question, is he still powerful to make peace in my life? 
Jesus cares when we're in great danger. Jesus cares when we have great doubts. But thirdly this morning is Jesus wants me to make great discoveries. It's not the storm for the storm's sake. It's the fact that everything that's written is written so that we might believe, as John mentioned in John chapter 21, and, or John chapter 20, and believing that we might have life in his name. Jesus wants me to make great discoveries. Discovery number one, the power of the Lord. He wants me to make great discoveries about his power. Jesus arises, he does three things. He rebukes the wind. He speaks to it sharply. Stop it. You tell my kids that sometimes. Stop it. You speak to it sharply. Then Jesus speaks to the waves and the seas, and he says literally, silence. Hush your mouth. Be muzzled just like a dog. And then he thirdly comments on the fear of these disciples and the lack of faith in these disciples. And there is such a great power in the one in the boat, so much so that two of these writers of the three that give this account comment on this fear of these disciples. And literally, after they'd seen this, the disciples feared mega fear, phobos. Oh, there's a lot of people that have fear today, fear of germs and fear of contact and fear of getting too close to somebody else. But these men had that phobos, that fear, that mega phobos. It's not about the storm. It's about the one that calmed the storm. It's not about the danger that they were in. It was the one that got them out of that danger and seemingly without difficulty. There is great power in the one in the boat. And what... Mark, what Matthew, what Luke, what the gospel writers want us to do is stand in awe, not of the storms in our lives, but in the power of God in our lives. They discovered something that night that would shape their perception of Jesus as master, as their savior. They discovered something about his power. They discovered something, number two, about his promises. The Lord's word is good. Look back in your Bible, please, to chapter 4 and verse 35. We read this almost as a passing statement of no consequence. But I would argue that this is of great consequence. The Lord got in the boat and he said, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And think about that just for a moment because we're going to gloss over this comment, but doesn't this speak to the surety of the word of the Lord? The Lord's purpose was that they were on this side, they were going to get to that side. Isn't it true that is there anything in this universe, in this world, in the spiritual realm that can stop the Lord if it is that he's got it in his purposes to do this and get this plan from A to B? If God says it, you can count on it. God cannot lie, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. His word will not fail. The grass may wither, the flower may fade, but the word of our God stands forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. And so many times we sacrifice peace in our lives because we don't know the word of God. So many times we're tossed and driven by the waves and we forget because we don't know or we gloss over something that's important in the word of God that's powerful for your life and powerful for my life. We have so little faith because we know his word so little. You really want to not be shaken by things like the present distress Deepen your relationship with God. More on that in just a moment. Number three, what else did they discover? They discovered something about the presence of the Lord. He is with us, even though it may seem that he's not there. Look just for a moment at Mark chapter 4 and verse 36, because again, here's another thing that we gloss over. This was not the only boat that was fighting in the storm. There were other little boats that were with him. Did you ever think... That by how you live your life and by how you show confidence in the master over the tempest, you might be able to give peace to somebody else who is also struggling in the storm. There are a lot of worried people today. There are a lot of people that would do well to turn off their TVs and silence their phones or maybe uh, put their phone in the middle of their closet and pile clothes on top of it so they won't, uh, they won't have it anymore. And you look at those things that people are going through, and as we travel, the first question I've got to ask is, is Jesus truly in my vessel? 
Number two, how am I showing confidence in Jesus? And number three, how is that confidence affecting other people in their lives and in them working against the storms? These disciples learned something about the power of the one who was in the boat. They learned something about his promises, but they learned something about his presence. He's there. He cares not only for those in the boat, but those who are also struggling in the storm. What else did they discover? They discovered something about the purposes of the Lord. This was a night of great discoveries. What did they think? Prior to this, if I go back chronologically of what's gone on already, they've seen Jesus heal the demon-possessed man in the synagogue, Mark chapter 1. They'd seen Jesus heal Peter's mother-in-law, Mark chapter 1. They'd seen Jesus heal the leper and the paralytic and, and turn water to wine and have the miraculous catch of fish. And they'd seen the man healed at the pool of Bethesda and, and the widow of Nain's son and other miracles that we probably don't even have recorded. But this is what they feared a great fear about. And consider the fact that sometimes we don't truly grasp what the Lord has done until it really affects us personally, until we ourselves have gone through the. Listen, it's one thing to realize that the people over in Wuhan, China, are dealing with the present distress. It's another thing whenever we have that present distress that comes to our doorstep and realize that the storm is affecting us and affecting our ability to earn a living or affect our ability to, to, to get around or affecting our ability to come and worship as I sit here in a majority of an empty auditorium this morning. But consider also, Jesus wanted these men to know his power and his position not only in the present distress, but also in going forward. We're only two chapters away in Mark chapter 6, where it is that these disciples are out in the boat at night again, and where it is that Jesus is not in the boat with them that time. And in Mark chapter 6, they think as they see him coming, walking on the water in the midst of this storm, they think it's a ghost. Sometimes it is that we're allowed storms in our life, not necessarily to hurt us, but to help us to grow. What the Lord wants us to remember more than anything else is that he's there and he's working on our behalf, if we'll just trust him. They wanted him to know about the peace of the Lord. When that great storm came, there was nothing in those minds of those disciples that would have ever considered the result after it was that the master of the tempest was able to fix them. After that great storm came a great calm, a great tranquility. Have you ever been out on the lake or seen a, a, a large body of water early in the morning and how it's just like glass, looking at that? That's the picture here of what Jesus was able to make in his disciples' lives. At a word from the Lord, what was violent, a deafening roaring of the water became as still and as quiet as could be and did so with only two words in the Greek from the Lord. I kind of wonder if that's what Paul was thinking about whenever he wrote Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, the peace of God, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We may feel like on the inside that there's a storm raging and we haven't called upon the Lord for help. These disciples discovered something about the peace of the Lord. Folks, it's not found in trying to paddle and keep up with the latest developments. It's not found in reading what somebody over in some place said about this and somebody else has a conflicting opinion. And truthfully, one of the best things that we can do one of the best things we can do in our own present distress, turn off the TV, silence your phone, turn off any kind of notifications that you get about what's going on in our world and just worship. Spend time in quietness. Spend time reflecting on the master of the storm and that will give you a peace that this world can't give you. What else did they discover? They discovered something about the person of the Lord. Note what they're asking. Who can this be that even the winds and the waves obey him? Literally, this is a military term with regard to obey. This is one who commands something else as an inferior. They realize that Jesus has as much power as that military general who commands his troops and they couldn't just go and march off a cliff 
if it was that that was what he commanded. And Jesus is the one that, when it was that he spoke to the storm, he commanded them as a superior commanding and inferior. Folks, I can't, I don't have that kind of power. I don't have the type of word that can just speak and have all of our lives go back to normal. But what I understand is the living word of God, by him that all things were made, without him there was nothing that was made that was made, Colossians chapter 1. Do we obey him, knowing his power? That causes me to reflect on when Jesus speaks to me through his word and tells me how it is that he wants me to conduct my life, how he wants me to use my tongue and my mind and my eyes and my hands and my feet. How do I respond? Do I respond the same way that the storm responded immediately? Recognizing him as sovereign, him as the commanding military general. Humans are God's crowning achievement. Humans are special in all of creation. And as all of creation bows down before him, God's fervent desire, more than taking away the storm, is that we bow down before him, that we take the time to acknowledge him as Lord, as master, as superintendent over the storm. Because the truth is that all of us are accountable to his word. Every single one of us has a responsibility to follow him and his word. Jesus said, the word that I've spoken, the same will judge him in the last day, John 12, verses 48 through 50. Acts 17, God now commands men everywhere to repent. We have a responsibility to be obedient to God's word. We have a responsibility to discover the power of God to make calm in our lives, even in the midst of storms like what we're going through now. This is our message for this morning, that it doesn't matter what you're going through in this life or how difficult things get. It doesn't matter how Many talking heads tell us, oh, the end is near, or, or doom is inevitable, or, or uh, we're still months away from this being resolved. You know what? That may be true, but I, I'm going to still try and trust in the master over the storm. You're still going to try and trust in the master of the storm because we're following him. And I can't heed the word of a man more than the word of him who's able to create calm in the storm. I hope this lesson has been encouraging for you. I hope this worship time has been encouraging. Again, I wish I could give hugs to every single person. Um, maybe one day signs will figure out how, to, how we could do virtual hugs, I, but still it wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be a, a good substitute. But what I do know more than anything else is the word of God is comforting to troubled hearts. And as we strive to live our lives <clears throat> in a way that God is pleased, as we try to live our lives, even in the midst of things that we haven't seen in our generation or in our lifetime or in the lifetime of several others, we're still going to trust in God, and we're still going to follow the master over the tempest. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when Oh,
and then closing remarks before closing prayer and a final song. As a congregation, we would like to rejoice with the family of Jason Thompson at his baptism, and we ask our members to please send him a card or a note to welcome him to the family of Christ. For our members, we ask that you would please get a copy of the reminder and review it for important dates and prayer opportunities for, for those who need our prayers. Also for our, our members, we would like to remind you to view the Sunday morning Bible class video that has been prepared and to make time for the Wednesday Bible class lesson and Devo that will be uploaded later. Also, we'd like to remind you to not neglect your daily Bible reading. Please keep up with your daily Bible reading. And please pray for this situation that has caused an interruption to our assembly. Finally, we would like our members to remember to check on other members regularly. Check on your friends, your neighbors, and especially those who are at high risk from the disease that's caused by this virus. And if you're not a member of the Graber Road Church of Christ or the Church of Christ, we recognize that this service may be something that you're not accustomed to. Please note that this service is based on extensive search and study of God's Word. And we invite you, if you have any questions about this service, or the scriptures that have been referenced, please contact us. You can find our contact information at www.graverroad.com. Now I'll lead us in a closing prayer and then we'll have one final song. Almighty God in heaven, 
we bow before you and we have worshiped you in the spirit and truth that we understand you desire from those who worship you. We pray, Father, now that as we lead our lives that you'll help us to fear you and to walk in your ways, that we might be a bright light to those around us. We pray, Father, that you will give us a deep faith, a faith that will sustain us through these difficult times, a faith that will help us to, to behave as your children, to have trust and faith in you to provide for us. We pray for the leaders of the world. We pray, Father, in heaven for those who are trying to combat this disease and this virus. We pray that you will, that you will protect them from the, the disease. And Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We ask you to comfort them and to turn to your word and to our Lord for peace and comfort that you give. We pray that you will watch over us. We pray that you'll be patient with us, and we pray that you will forgive us when we fail you. Help us, Father, to fear most of all, making you unhappy or being unfaithful to you. For it's in the name of our Lord that we pray. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide upon you. With his sheets and curly fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we
Redeemer.